Greetings everyone, I am Dr. J, and welcome to my review of Hob. This is a game which caught me by surprise when it released, as I had just had a really busy week, and the release didn't seem to get all that much fanfare. Regardless, it was a game that I was really interested in for a couple of reasons. First and foremost, it's a game by Runic, whom you may know from the excellent Torchlight series. To say that I've spent a bit of time in them would be the understatement of the year, so naturally that means I'm in a position where I want to like whatever they make. Second, it wasn't a Diablo-style game like the Torchlight series, but instead looked to be something in the vein of The Legend of Zelda. Since I'm almost exclusively a PC gamer, to where my only real experience of Zelda was Twilight Princess, that left me even more intrigued, as this is a genre that I rarely get to look at. The question for me then was whether my interest would be justified, and how well Runic would be able to do when they stepped out of their comfort zone. So without further ado, let's dive into it. If I'm honest, I'm not sure where to begin when talking about this game, as more so than most games I've played, everything ties into each other really well. So, I guess what better place to start than at the beginning? When you first enter the game, you are greeted with a robot or golem looking thing opening an intricate doorway, which should tell you all you need to know about the game's art style. I've described it as steampunk to some of my friends, but when I think about it, I'm not sure how accurate that label is. Sure, there are some elements that definitely are in that style, at least when it comes to the look, but outside of a few bits of strange circuitry, almost everything you come across ranging from that robot in the architecture is very much made of stone. Regardless of how you want to define it, I will fight anyone who claims that it doesn't look good because holy crap is it nice to look at. The game is even self-aware enough of that fact to add in points where you just sit down and look at the landscape around you. This might show too much of my hand when it comes to the gameplay discussion, but those points are really useful to convey a sense of wonder and intrigue. The area that you're moving around in is really fascinating on both a visual and technical level, and those moments really allow you to just sit back and take it all in. Beyond the aesthetic, you'll also notice one other thing that stands out, and that is when the robot starts communicating with the protagonist, who I'm just going to call Hob for lack of another name. More specifically, look at what isn't there. Subtitles. Yes, this is a game that does have some degree of communication, but what little is actually there is spoken in a language that we can't understand. That means the game is even more reliant on that visual element than otherwise, as everything you need to know has to be conveyed through it. Unfortunately, saying much more than that risks giving away what the plot actually is, but I'll give a quick summary of the idea. You are someone peeking out at a strange world, following a robot who is manipulating various objects within it to shape the world around it. Eventually, however, you soon learn that this world is not without its fair share of trouble, as you come across this cancerous-looking mass of disgusting stuff that doesn't in any way match the color palette around you. And after a certain scene that I dare not spoil, you learn to hate that stuff really quickly. For now, though, there isn't much you can do about it, but soon you are able to manipulate the world around you in a similar way through your robot buddy. This is where the gameplay and exploration start to come into play, as without the direct goal presented by a character we can understand, we must instead infer what to do based on the world around us and how we're able to interact with it. Through a mechanical arm that we receive early on, we are able to interface with much of this technology. And over the course of the game, we gain new abilities attached to that arm, learn more about the, for lack of a better word, modular world you're exploring, and sometimes have to protect ourselves against this land's less than friendly inhabitants. Since the combat feels the most disconnected from the rest of the game, let's tackle that first. Set combat is fairly simple to get a hold of, as you have a small number of tricks from your mechanical arm, a sword from the majority of your attacks, and a dodge roll which basically makes you untouchable. As you continue to explore, you'll receive resources to improve your weaponry, gain new tricks such as a shield or different outfit, increase the amount of health you have, and how often you can use your special abilities. Set combat is the weakest part of the game, because when push comes to shove, it's fairly basic and not all that challenging. It definitely feels satisfying to outmaneuver the various enemies, but there isn't all that much variety between them. And once you figure out a general technique for dealing with a given type of enemy, you're usually good for the rest of that type. The only time where I felt genuinely challenged was at the end, as I hadn't gathered every health increase possible. But even then, the game has no life system, and the respawn points are fairly generous. So even if there was something difficult, brute force would sometimes be enough for the combat portions. That isn't always the case with exploration, but more on that later. What you also might notice is that, outside of maybe the final room, there aren't any formal boss fights. Sure, there are plenty of enemies, but there isn't any point where an enemy goes full dungeon boss mode or deviates too much from what you've already seen. And yet, even if I might have scared some people away from the game by those points of contention, 
they actually didn't end up as a major detriment. To explain why, let's go back to the scenic views real quick. The tone that these reinforce is exactly why the combat isn't super challenging, and why there aren't any boss fights, because the game doesn't need them. The world presented is one that you're meant to wander through, explore and interact with, and while I love Torchlight 2's bombastic combat and boss fights, stitching those into this game would have ended up as a point of unnecessary frustration and probably hurt the relaxed tone overall. In fact, it wasn't until a Steam review pointed out that boss fights are absent that I actually turned around and realized, huh, I'm over halfway through this game and he's absolutely right. So, yeah, as much as I love my bombastic Diablo-style action, I'm just as surprised as you to say that having them here wouldn't have worked as well. So to fully explain that, let's stop beating around the bush and talk about what really worked in this game, that sense of exploration. Because, jeez, I never thought that anyone could take such a simple concept and somehow make an engaging 10-hour game almost entirely relying on that. When I really step back and analyze it, much of what you're doing can be summarized with the following thought process. Where can I go? Well, I can go here and manipulate this object in the world. Okay, let's do that and see what happens. Oh look, something moved over there, and now this section of the world just opened up. Okay, let's go in that direction and see what's waiting for us. That's pretty much the entire game, and yet it never gets dull and I'm having difficulty coming up with words to describe why. So let's start going through the list of things that work well and maybe the answer to that will become clear over the rest of this review. First and foremost, the amount of variety they were able to get is really impressive. All of the tricks you get to use during combat are also used for traversing through and interacting with the world around you. Though there aren't a lot of them, the way they ask you to use them is really clever with the best example being a small blink ability. Set ability doesn't completely replace the dive roll's usefulness, but for traversing the levels, you can use this on specially marked glowing pads to immediately teleport between them. The direction that a given pad is pointing in will tell you where you'll end up, and there may be some pads in between there as well. When they introduce you to them, they keep it simple, only using them for accessing a new area. Then, they demonstrate through a puzzle that the pads have to have line of sight of each other in order to work. Later still, you can manipulate their position and direction, which combined with a timing-based section, all feel fresh and interesting because they're spaced out appropriately and change up just enough to be different without falling into old-school point-and-click logic. Pretty much every trick in this game operates like this, to where the whole game feels like one massive Zelda dungeon with all these little mini-dungeons that pose a more directed challenge. And in order to make that work, the pacing is pitch perfect, with one little caveat to note. I think the pacing for the Blink example is self-explanatory, as outside of the enemy variety, everything else is given enough attention to where you're constantly moving and discovering something new. However, there was one point where I just went full read to, I mean, full game journalist. Totally. There was one point where I could hear an objective that I wanted to complete, but due to the current circumstances, I was unable to progress. I ended up spending half an hour or so running in circles trying to find a way forward, until I eventually went to a different area and found out exactly what I should have been doing. To be fair, there was a precedent set for this, as I mentioned earlier that going through this game is a matter of exploration and seeing what can be done within your current scope. The missing link I had in my mind is that I didn't expect that to apply across large sections of the map, as well as within those sections in particular. In fact, this might be the one rare case where I can say, if you think you've missed something, you probably haven't and should look elsewhere. Even if you did actually miss something and I'm a giant liar, you'll likely have found a monster to distract you or a collectible to hunt down, and by the time you double back to that section, you'll be able to approach it with a fresh set of eyes and notice exactly what you missed the first time. This was especially helpful when there was more than one place I could explore at once, as it kept me from going full game journalist at one other point later in the game. Speaking of those collectibles, there's another reason why you'll want to go exploring every nook and cranny, because those things aren't going to gather themselves up now, are they? Thankfully for me, there aren't a metric ton of them, but there's enough variety to the collectibles to where you'll want to hunt them down anyway. I've already mentioned that some pertain to combat, but when it comes to buying upgrades, you have three things to keep track of. First, the actual schematics themselves, as they aren't just going to be handed to you by your robot friend. Second, you have these butterfly-looking things that are scattered throughout the map, which are used almost exclusively for garment upgrades. Set upgrades are swappable and usually confer some benefit in exchange for a penalty. For instance, the one I found most useful and used for the final section was one that reduced the charge rate on my glove powers but doubled my health, which is actually kind of broken when it came to said final section. The rest of the resources are used for everything else and are collected when you defeat certain tough enemies, while the rest are found through the same canisters that you find schematics in. Outside of that, 
you will also find the fallen figures of people who look very similar to yourself. And while they may be little more than dust now, you can use their swords to improve your own. In fact, they lock away some of the game's secrets behind doors based on how much you've upgraded your sword. So if you're a completionist, what's behind the door along the grapple path? I haven't found the last sword piece at the time of recording and I'm too lazy to look it up, but I really want to know. That element of mystery is also a major reason why I found myself motivated to keep going. Everything is told through symbols, body language, tone of voice, and the movement of the world itself. Meaning you're never directly told what exactly is going on. Even at the end, I got thrown for a loop as to what I thought was going on, simply because I misinterpreted how a certain character was acting. In fact, their use of the other characters is really clever, as all of them in some way play a role in driving the story forward. Your robot friend is one of them, as while we can't understand him, Hob knows enough to mark on the map where to go next, giving you an indication as to where to start looking. You also have these cute little whatever they are, I just called them sprites because of how lively the word sounds, and look at them, just... Look, they might have turned me into a teenage girl for the briefest of moments, and I can neither confirm nor deny that that happened, and now everyone's gonna judge me for saying that, and moving swiftly on, these guys are really nice to have around because they serve a few different roles. The two that are most pertinent are as guides, as along with your robot friend, where they flit off to can give you an idea as to where to go next. Second, they also act as a pseudo-reward mechanism, as they show up whenever you've taken down all of the unfriendly creatures in an area, and who doesn't love to make these lovable little things happy? What with their little weird cute warbling sound in there. I'm off on that tangent again, aren't I? Okay, so to close off the exploration discussion, there's one final piece to all of it, and it comes down to the design of the world, literally. As mentioned earlier, it's a very modular world, which means when you interact with something, various structures and even the landscape itself will shift in response. Some of it makes it easier to backtrack for secrets, especially for ones that become accessible when you get a new toy, or the land shifts in such a way that it becomes easier to approach. That means not only do you get the sense of progress for moving forward, you also get the visual indication to report said progress. That alone might be enough to recommend to the more artistic types, as it's such a clever analogy that even if the rest of the game didn't hold up to scrutiny, I could still give serious props to the idea. Before I run off, let's cover a couple of smaller topics that I wasn't quite able to fit into the rest of the review. To start with, the music wasn't very noticeable, but due to the aesthetic and ambience, it was exactly as noticeable as it needed to be. The music that plays whenever you go onto a scenic view is really nice, and there's enough foreign instrumentation to add to this sense of intrigue. It doesn't work quite as well on me since I played steel drums in high school and can recognize when they're being used, but hey, props anyway. I'm not going to complain about the composer for Tristram doing what he does best, and call it a blind spot if you will, but I like Matt Eelman's work, and I really like what he did for this game as well. What doesn't work as well as the performance, but in this regard, it is entirely my fault. Because not only did I make the mistake of keeping fairly high settings for things such as textures and other graphical settings, but I tried to record the game throughout as well. In fact, I'm kind of surprised that the game was able to maintain 30 FPS for the most part, despite only knocking down the shadow and shader qualities. Though I'm sure a well-trained eye will be able to tell when it dipped below that in what I've shown. Just know that it's because I was recording the whole thing and because I have a very low-end system. If you need a more equitable comparison, it ran about as well on my computer as Torchlight 2 does. And given the difference in age between the two, I'm not going to raise any complaints here. Said performance didn't end up impeding much, which is really good because otherwise the controls would have been a lot more frustrating to deal with. Before too much is implied, however, I do overall like the controls, as they are fairly reliable, and even when they aren't, the game is very forgiving with both its hit detection and checkpoints. Most of my complaints there are minor ones, as Hob was a little too eager to climb onto boxes that I wished to push around, and the grapple hook for some reason was more finicky than it should have been. There was also a weird inconsistency with any ladder or climbable wall, as normally the directional controls are relative to your camera, but instead of obeying those rules, the ladders have fixed direction based on the ladder itself. That also fed into my difficulties with the grapple hook, as I expected it to follow the ladder rules when it followed the relative direction rules, because climbing with the grapple and climbing with your hands are apparently just that much different from each other. Also, bear in mind that I was using an Xbox controller, and my time spent with keyboard and mouse was minimal at best. Outside of what I've mentioned, I had no issues with the controller, and based on what I've seen, the keyboard appears to be serviceable if you don't have a controller. I can't say that for certain, however, as I haven't spent a great deal of time with it, so you might want to look up a little more about that if you're unsure. Overall, I think my opinion on this game has been made quite clear over how much I gushed over the core gameplay loop. When I step back and look at it objectively, I can definitely see where it isn't as strong and where it may be overly repetitive. 
But much like the interconnected and beautiful world that you find yourself in, the game is just as well crafted. Everything within it meshes so well together, making the pacing work absolutely perfectly. Combine that with a laid-back atmosphere and enough uncertainty and collectibles to encourage exploration, and you have something that I can recommend to virtually anyone. To some degree though, I think that's also because of where I've been lately. It's been more difficult for me to find time to sit down and play something new and interesting. Much of my spare time has been spent either keeping tabs on a world that just keeps getting more complex by the second, and spending time with routines and entertainment that I enjoy but can sometimes grow dull over time. And when you have those circumstances in your life, sometimes something simpler like Hob is exactly what you need. It's not a complex game, nor is it a challenging one, but I can say that it is very rewarding and absolutely worth playing through yourself. If you're interested, you can find it on either Steam or GOG. That's all I have for this video, thank you all for watching. Please like and share this if you find it deserving, and subscribe to this channel for more game reviews as well as other content posted on a not-so-regular basis. Also, in case anyone's confused about the timing of this review, I mentioned before that it caught me by surprise when it first released, but I did still manage to finish playing through it within a month of said release. The problem was that I didn't anticipate just how busy my last semester at college was going to be, so rather than trying to push out a review during that chaotic time period, I thought it would be best to upload this alongside a Steam sale. So, if you're watching this close to when this video comes out, then maybe it'll be a little easier to pull the trigger on than otherwise. In the meantime, while you go make up your mind, I'm gonna see what I might want from said Steam sale, and we'll see you all later.